All right, so we've spent some time looking at how nutrients move through the soil towards roots, how um, the nutrients move through the root from the epidermis into the vascular tissue, um, through the parent-free space, and then how it uh, has to cross at some point a cell membrane, um, which involves various modes, possible modes of transport, um, active transport, utilizing a phosphorylated carrier protein or um, uh, facilitated diffusion down an electrochemical gradient if we're looking at charged ions and solutes. And uh, also active transport involving a hydrogen ion pump, um, which um, continues the membrane potential to help drive that electrochemical gradient for these charged ions. Um, and so we looked at a uniport system versus a symport system. And now we're just going to kind of step back and look at how uh, once the nutrients are in the plant, um, you know, how that affects uh, where the plants go, uh, how, how um, those nutrients are allocated, how that affects um, uh, different ecosystem level, um, potential ecosystem level dynamics as well, um, sort of plant and soil kind of interactions. All right, so we'll start with this question, how does nutrient availability and uptake affect uh, allocation of nutrients and by allocation we mean basically where do the nutrients go. So in this first diagram we can see that um, the nit as the nitrogen supply increases from right from left to right um, when we have a large a high high nitrogen supply here on the right we can see that more um, growth is allocated to the shoot and here's the root. So we would refer to this as ha um, where high nitrogen supply is, um, where there's high nitrogen supply, then there is a decrease in the root to shoot ratio. In contrast, when we see that uh, under low nitrogen supply, in this figure we can see here, we can see here's the shoot once again, and here's the root. And so this results in a, um, a high, what we consider a high root to shoot ratio. All right, and so the question is, um, <clears throat> why would there be a difference? Well, basically, the idea is um, that plants will allocate growth or metabolism, whatever is needed, um, in this case, growth uh, for nutrients to maximize, or relative to nutrient availability, to maximize um, resource acquisition. So, oops, acquisition. So when nitrogen is limiting, then plants will allocate more growth towards the roots so that they can penetrate the soil more readily and more, more widespread. Um, and, and um, perhaps allocate more new, uh, energy to mycorrhizae or to root hairs to try, try to penetrate and access different parts of the soil that would otherwise be un, unavailable. When um, nutrient supply is low, is a uh, high rather, uh, on the right here, you can see that the plant is, uh, you know, apparently getting enough nutrients closer to the base of the plant. And so they, so the plant allocates more growth towards the shoot, again, to maximize resource acquisition, but this time from the shoot area. So by growing taller than its neighbors, by spreading out wider than its neighbors, it can outshade neighbors and access more light. Um, and nitrogen is something that they need, plants need um, in large quantities in order to, to um, maximize photosynthesis. So, so how widespread is that um, response? Uh, at the bottom here we can see uh, that when we look at when nitrogen is um, supplied in excess or phosphorus is supplied or both to, you know nitrogen and phosphorus that we see a, a response here across different ecosystems from terrestrial systems here we have grassland, forest, shrubland, tundra, and wetland, to freshwater systems, streams, and lakes, to marine systems, that when nitrogen is, and nitrogen and phosphorus is um, supplied in higher uh, amounts, that the response ratio increases. And in this case, the response ratio would be the shoot 
to root ratio showing <clears throat> that when there's higher nitrogen and phosphorus available here, for example, in the grassland, then the response ratio goes up, which would have to be the shoot to root ratio in this case. More allocation to the shoot. When less nitrogen or phosphorus is available than, um, well, in this case, when nitrogen is in X is um, supplied, but phosphorus is still low, or if phosphorus is supplied, but nitrogen is still low, then, then we don't see as much shoot growth. And so that's why we have the lower bars there on the, in the first two segments of each of these um, parts of the graph. All right, so then that brings us to um, what happens basically when there is a, um, a, a nitrogen that's in short supply, how does the plant respond? So we can sort of phrase this as um, how does nutrient availability um, affect differential nutrient uptake? In other words, um, differential nutrient uptake. So uh, for example, um, in other words, it, when nitrogen is in short supply, which is in indicated as the stress, um, what happens to the uptake of nitrogen compared to the uptake of other nutrients, in, ca in this case phosphate and, sul phosphate and sulfate? Um, and so what we see is that that the absorption rate of the of, um, you know, in other words, the, the amount of ammonium and nitrate absorbed compared to a control where these were not in limiting supply, there is a, um, an increase in the, in the uptake of these nutrients, uh, whereas phosphate and sulfate are much lower in, in the amount of uptake there. When phosph phosphorus is uh, in short supply, you can see that phosphate uptake increases, so the plant you know, is, is taking up more and more phosphate at the expense of sulfate and nitrate. Uh, and then we can compare the other, you know, when sulfate is in is uh, limited, um, again, uptake is upregulated, nitrate and phosphate is uptake is downregulated. So plants respond to this differential, um, to different nutrient availability by uh, modulating the amount of uptake of a certain nutrient um, um, so basically we can kind of explain that by stating that transport proteins or transport protein synthesis um, is induced by the present presence of the nutrient is induced by the presence of the nutrient. So when a nutrient is available then uh, the protein synthesis of that transport protein is going to um, uh, increase. And when um, we have nutrients in low supply, that causes upregulation of that protein, of that transport protein. So, we'll jot this down. When nutrient, let's say when a nutrient is in short supply or is limited, Um, plants upregulate protein synthesis of that nutrients transporter and also downregulates Um, other transporter their nutrient there we go alright so that shows that helps us understand um, why we see this different these different rates of uptake or the different um, allocation of uptake towards the uh, nutrient and limited supply. All right, speaking of nutrient supply, um, the graph 
that we see at the top here shows us how plants respond to different um, levels of nutrient availability. Availability. So we can catch this in this question. Hmm. How do plants respond in terms of th things like um, for growth? Um, mainly we're looking at biomass accumulation, uh, other things we could measure, relative growth rate. Um, how do, how do plants respond um, respond to different levels, sorry, different levels of nutrient availability. So just kind of expanding on the first graph that showed us how, how it allocates different, um, uh, grows to different areas. When nutrients are in what's considered a deficient level, available at deficient levels, then that's when we will see um, plants develop symptoms. And we looked, uh, we will look, or we did look at a lot of these um, symptoms uh, to determine or to, to basically diagnose what the deficiency was. All right, and then there's this adequate zone, which is shown here. Um, where the higher the availability, the more the growth. And so there's sort of a linear relationship where the availability of the nutrient limits growth um, kind of in a, a sort of regular um, slope here. Once that availability is sort of maximized, then you can see growth is going to level off here. And that's what we refer to as luxury consumption. So the plant continu can continue to take up um, nutrients and plants will are different in in terms of the level of um, luxury consumption that they continue to participate in. But essentially, a plant normally limited in a new nutrient suddenly that nutrient becomes available. The plant's going to um, continue to take up that nutrient, but not turn it into growth, but more likely store it into vacuoles or um, into the central vacuole and that sort of thing. Uh, and then at a high enough um, uh, availability, that's when we start to see symptoms again. But these symptoms are related to toxicity, um, where even nitrogen, for example, can cause symptoms of toxicity, where we see sort of nitrogen burn on the edges of the leaves and so forth. Now, we won't talk so much about toxic symptoms, um, but we did, or we will, if we haven't yet, depending on where we are in the class, um, talk about symptoms for deficiencies of things like, um, we will talk about deficiencies of uh, mobile nutrients, which are nitrogen, um, phosphorus, these are mobile inside the plant, um, potassium, and uh, let's see, one more I know is out there, magnesium. And then also we'll talk about deficiencies of less mobile um, nutrients like calcium and iron. So these are the ones we'll talk about to, to make sure we can diagnose their, um, their symptoms, use the symptoms to diagnose the deficiencies.